further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Jim Leonard. Jim is a retired chemist and the lab director for Three Daughters Brewing. Before retiring, Jim served as the senior director of international, um, the senior director of international regulatory affairs at Pfizer. Uh, he has extensive experience as a quality control chemist, uh, including two PhDs from the University of Michigan. Now, since moving, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Uh, since moving to Florida in 2005, Jim has taught at SPC and USS St. Pete, and he was instrumental in setting up a craft beer internship, get a load of that, uh, for biology majors at USS St. Pete for Three Daughters Brewing and uh, many other craft breweries in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, he is here to explain why clean water is very crucial for good quality beer. So hops and uh, malted grain and yeast can be shipped in. So we can buy that material and ship it in. You can see bags of uh, malt back there. You can go to the cooler there and see tubs of yeast. And you can see little hop pellets. Uh, but the water, the water is local. So the water is the only ingredient that can be truly called local. So everybody who opens up a craft brewery around this area, they are using the water that's in the local area. That's true around the world. Um, except for people like Anna Bush, who changed the water, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so water is the only primary ingredient that a brewmaster has any control over. And, but water is a major constituent of beer. So uh, when you open up a brewery, you have the option, you're going to use the water that you have there. You're not going to ship in uh, 100,000 gallons of water. Uh, so you can use it as it is. And if you do use it as it is, you want to do certain things to it. You can use it pretty much as it is, but you want to filter it to remove the chlorine or chloramines, which are put in there to uh, sanitize it. Uh, you can modify it by uh, either adding ions. Everybody know what an ion is? Like calcium or magnesium or something like that, or removing ions that you don't want. Um, and we do a little bit of uh, changing to the water chemistry here, but not very much at this point. Uh, or you can make water from scratch. Basically, you can take the uh, city water and you can put it through a reverse osmosis system. And so you're stripping everything out of it. But you can't make beer with that because uh, the yeast wouldn't survive. You couldn't uh, convert the starches to sugars in the mash time because you need a certain amount of those calcium and, and magnesium ions and things like that. So you can strip it, but then you're going to have to add it back. So it's much simpler to use it as you have it, monitor the water carefully, and then uh, add whatever you need to add. And help you so you really need to monitor the water source. And uh, actually in the quality assurance lab back here, we have a complete water chemistry setup. So we test the water on a regular basis. And what we're doing now, uh, because we do filter, we have a carbon filter, so we remove the chlorine, chloramines from the water. We have to make sure that carbon filter is working. So we'll test the water for uh, total chlorine and free chlorine, things like that, to make sure that the carbon filter is working. If it's not working, then we'll replace the filter. And we also have a water softener here, so we'll check for the water hardness levels. Uh, brewing water cannot be soft water. Brewing water is the hard water that we're using right, right from the municipal water supply. Soft water, we make soft water because we have a gas boiler back there. And if you use hard water in that gas boiler, it's going to get filled up with scale and it's going to destroy the boiler. We also we use the soft water for a lot of other things in brewing besides making beer. So it's never used in brewing beer. 
So uh, water makes a region's here unique. Uh, water chemistry can affect the conversion. So I, I mentioned that one of the primary ingredients is malt. So malt is grain that's been germinated. It's basically when it's germinated, you're getting a grain to start to grow, and then it creates these little enzyme packets. Those enzyme packets are there to convert the starch into sugars. You gotta stop the germination, otherwise the grain will continue to grow and make more grain. We don't want that to happen. So you stop the uh, germination, it becomes a malt. Then that malt is put into a mash tun, and uh, you've got those enzymes, you heat it up in hot water, and those enzymes are converting the starch to sugars. But if you don't have the right kind of water with the right ions, the right pH, then that's not gonna happen very well. Also, the yeast. Uh, if you try to make yeast from very pure, or try to make beer from very pure water, then the yeast isn't gonna be very happy because it needs that calcium or magnesium to, to uh, work in the fermentation process. All right, the water profile of uh, various brewing cities around the world, there's a very soft water supply in a place called Pilsen, which is a place, that's the place where Pilsner originated. Pilsner are very uh, light beer, a lager. So lagers are made with very, with very soft water. You can see the amount of uh, calcium, magnesium, and the alkalinity are very low. But when you're looking at places like uh, London and Munich, then you can see that the water there is a very, it's harder water. You got a lot more calcium, a lot more magnesium, and the water in St. Petersburg is very similar to that. So it's great for making ales, which is what most of the craft brew people are, are making. We also we make, occasionally make a lager or a filter, but that's a different story, so we're gonna go into that. Beer is 95% water in composition, but the amount of water uh, to produce beer is far greater than the amount of uh, uh, water that's actually in the beer itself. So the U.S., this is a, uh, I uh, got from the internet, so it must be true. Uh, it's about seven barrels of uh, water for every barrel of beer that's made. Now, does that sound like a lot? Do you know that it takes one gallon of water for every almond that's grown in California? It takes about four to nine gallons of water for every head or every bunch of uh, broccoli that's grown. So think about that. I mean, this is a lot of water. We're using a lot of water here. You know, the post of is not within the beer itself, but it's also just part of the process of making beer. So uh, about 30% of the water that we're bringing in goes into the beer, and 70% of the water is actually going out of the plant. Is that good? So here's a little uh, pie diagram. You can see that uh, the brewing water is about one third One third of the water consumed is uh, used in the brew house. The rest of it is for sanitation. If you look at these large fermenters over here, the right tank, the brew house, everything over here is gets, every time you make a beer, you can it or package it, you've got to sanitize those fermenters. You've got to wash them out. You can make sure they're absolutely spotless. And we use a technology that's based on firefly chemistry to look at the sanitation process to make sure there aren't any bugs in there. If you want to see a demonstration of that, see me later in the lab. So the water that's going out into the effluent, uh, it's coming from the mash, from the water ton, from the fermenters and things like that. And the water that's going out, well, some people say that uh, beer is just contaminated water. So basically you're drinking the effluent. Kind of. <laughs> Not quite as good. But... So it's got a lot of uh, yeast solids. It's got, well, not a lot of yeast solids. It's got yeast solids. It has protein. It's got amino acids. It's got nitrogenous compounds. Uh, some spent grain. We actually have, if you look at the brew house back there, if you ever get a chance to have a tour, you can see the bottom. There's a false uh, bottom where we actually collect the spent grain. And then we actually, farmers will come in and use that spent grain for animal feed. So it does get recycled. Yes. Uh, so the type of packaging uh, has a significant impact. Uh, right now we are, as you can see those cans over there, we just started canning about five or six months ago. Before that it was all kegs. So when we're, all, when we're just packaging in kegs, that's a very small uh, use of water. Then we start gearing up for producing cans, so now we are three times the distribution that we had when we were doing kegs. We're using a bit more water. Uh, it's a small brewery, it's about uh, 3,000 barrels per year, and next year we should have about 10,000 barrels per year. 
a barrel is 30 US gallons, a little over 30. So the size of the brewery has a major influence on the amount of water that you use and whether you can reduce the water. But reducing the water uh, or the effluent, uh, we're focusing on water conservation with positive effects, uh, both uh, water and waste water reduction in the brewery. So, uh, the small craft uh, brewers are just beginning to explore water and uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, the cost of the incoming water is very low in terms of the other utilities that, you're, that we are paying for. So, you know, we're looking at when the water comes in, it doesn't cost us very much, but once you start uh, having to treat the effluent as it's going out, and you start looking at water usage, and trying to conserve water usage, and the price is going to go up. So that's something that small craft brewers need to keep in mind. So water uh, consumption and wastewater uh, disposal remain uh, environmental and economic hurdles that directly affect breweries and the brewing process. And uh, there's a water and uh, wastewater sustainability manual that was just produced, has been produced by the Brewers Association. So that's a guide for all the small craft breweries to help them put together a, a sustainability program. Uh, I'm the director of the uh, USF St. Petersburg Brewing Arts Program, which is starting up soon. And one of the key modules that we're going to be speaking about, uh, we're going to have a, a whole module on water, water sustainability, water and brewing, how to modify the water with uh, chemistry, but also how to uh, develop a sustainability program within the brewery. So we're, we aren't wasting water, and the water we're putting back is, is, has been treated properly. Well, thank you. Any, uh, any questions at this point? Beer is 95% water. It's amazing. Um, I would now like to introduce Ray Wunderlich III. Um, Ray is a native to St. Pete. He has extensive experience working as uh, with all of our local streams and waterways across Pinellas County. Um, he's an urban farmer and educator and a healthcare alternative healthcare practitioner. He is here to talk about why clean water is important for farming and, and for our health. Thanks very much for inviting me here today. It's great to see everyone here. Clean water, that's why we're here. It's in the news all the time. This was in the Tampa Bay Times. Florida paying to store water. Something about water all the time in the press. I'm old school newspaper. Anyway, um, I appreciate it. I just offloaded about 200 gallons of beer mash from a neighboring brewery into the compost pile at the garden at Boyd Hill, Pioneer Settlement Garden, in which uh, my, I'm the director of the garden there. We have so many volunteers here today. There, so we use a sustainability process there at the Pioneer Garden. We use materials from local restaurants, and uh, use that to enrich our soil later on in the year, about four months down the way. Anyway, I used to work at my father's nutritional medicine clinic. We're going to have a different perspective here. I'm only going to be talking for a brief amount of time, but it's a very interesting perspective that I don't think a lot of people know about relating to our bodies and having us at the top of the food chain. As a gardener, an educator in several fields, we depend really on, on clean water for not only our health, but for our overall state's health. Our state is pockmarked with a aquifer. We have many different types of water bodies. We have swales, we have streams, we have ephemeral pools. All of these things and all these processes are connected. And all of our urbanization affects these types of things. If I'm not mistaken, every stream and creek in the city of St. Petersburg is an impaired water body. We have no streams or creeks in the city of St. Petersburg that's not impaired. That's saying something. We have kind of a sloppy um, model here. And that's why we're getting together and trying to, to change that. No, 
The good news is that Tampa Bay, this is a water body, and as I said before, our water bodies are connected. Tampa Bay is the cleanest it's been since the mid-1950s. We have many good stewards, such as the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, Tampa Bay Watch, and many nonprofits that pressure our elected officials and the people that we elect in, office, in, in, in our municipalities that make this happen. That's why we need to educate ourselves as much as we can so we can ask these people to represent us in these boards to make these water bodies as clean as they can be. We have more seagrass in the Tampa Bay area than we have ever had since recording. So that, that is something. The clinical practice I was involved with was my father. Every single person that came into our clinic had heavy metal toxicity. Every person that came into us had heavy metal toxicity, including myself. I dug up this test of mine. I have two or three heavy metal toxicities. Why? Because we don't have clean enough water. We don't have enough clean water. We don't have enough clean air. That affects our food. I'm making a segue into my garden topic next, okay? But individually, we can make a difference in our own bodies. We need to eat fresh foods more vegetables and fruits, not fruits and vegetables, more vegetables and fruits. Vegetables need to be the primary um, consumption, not fruit. You'd like to see my test after? <laughs> You're welcome to see it. So every single person that came to see us had heavy metal toxicities. If you create good soil, like we do at the Pioneer Settlement Sustainable Organic Garden, it not only produces great, huge, healthy vegetables, but they are much lower in these heavy metals. The amendments that we use, the special secret one, is seagrass or seaweed. Now you're saying, well, it comes from the bay, we got all kinds of hormones and heavy metals going on out there. Well, not as much as we did. There is no perfect system. It decreases the amount of water that we have to use in our gardens. It's a slow release nitrogen. That's what it's all about. We need to add, we need to have some nitrogen in our soils for our plants to grow up. That's their fertilizer. So we don't have to put on big southern fertilizer company here from the south. Right, Mosaic? So seagrass is a wonderful, wonderful amendment. It cuts down the amount of water. If it cuts down the amount of water, that cuts down the amount of runoff. That improves the water quality. So again, everything is connected. And I urge you in your own gardens, when you're going out there, use different soil amendments. Use ash and coal. Use beer mash. Use vegetables.